Victoria Beckham is a celebrity brand like no other, breaking barriers, expectations and prejudices to turn her hobby into something legitimately accepted by the fashion world 15 years later. However, the path hasn't always been easy, losing her tens of millions of pounds along the way. But was it worth it? Victoria Beckham was a celebrity known for her luxury fashion years before she launched her own label. She featured in fashion-forward shows like Ugly Betty. She was the first celebrity on the cover of Vogue US, along with the other Spice Girls members, in January 1998. She was on the cover of British Vogue Zolo for April 2008, and she'd already proved herself to be successful commercially with her jeans line, VB Rocks, that started in 2004, and DVB, that launched in Saks Fifth Avenue in 2007. To quote Victoria, People look at me and David, and they see fashion. They see family. They see sports. I think there are people who want to be a part of that. It's aspirational. Really, this would be the key to her early successes. You see, Victoria Beckham was never branded as a relatable celebrity. She was always positioned as aspirational, an aspect that would allow her to succeed in these ventures that were in or around the idea of luxury, where other celebrities just couldn't. Even the jeans were at a luxury price point, at around $250 per pair of jeans at launch, but went up to be around $385 per pair not too long after. However, it's noted with all of that said that DVB, the company that she owned, was exclusively made up of high margin items. They had what's on the screen, t-shirt, jeans and makeup, as well as sunglasses and perfumes. So they were clearly aware of how Victoria as a celebrity was positioned and were poised to take advantage of that with products that despite their low production cost, most people were willing to pay a premium for because they last a long time. For the consumer, they're a better investment, and for the celebrity, it's high volume, high margin, high profits. So, even though her commercial ventures at this point were still more on the cash grab side, they still gave off that sense of luxury, not cheapening her brand. But this wasn't enough. She discussed wanting DVB to expand into a larger, more legitimate and substantial company with children's and menswear, and she clearly wanted to be taken seriously, as she was explicit in this interview with WWD back in 2007 that she was very hands-on in the manufacturing process from choosing factories, rivets and threads. And yet, despite her big dreams, they were crushed shortly after when the brand was dropped by several major retailers. So what happened between this WWD interview where everything seemed so bright in February 2007 and the debut of the Victoria Beckham brand? The answer? Simon Fuller. Fuller was known, especially in the music industry, for thinking on a grand scale, a global scale, and was a real talent in understanding what made something have mass appeal. He was, at this time, the manager of 19 Entertainment Limited and had managed the Spice Girls, Victoria and David Beckham separately, S Club 7 and been behind Pop Idol and X Factor TV shows and was working to revive the career of designer Roland Mouret, who Victoria Beckham wore often. Fuller and Beckham had been distanced for some time because of the falling out with the Spice Girls, but reconciled in 2003 when it was noted that he promised Victoria Beckham the person that she would become a global brand. It's very likely, therefore, that he had a toe or two in her previously mentioned fashion ventures and was thought that he was a part of the force behind their famed takeover of America when they moved there. For this reason, it's interesting, though never explicitly acknowledged, that Fuller was, along with Robert Dodds, named as directors when Victoria Beckham was set up as its own company, Beckham Ventures Limited, on the 28th of February 2008, with David and Victoria joining later on the 29th of July and the 5th of August 2008, respectively. The difference, though, between Fuller and Dodds was that Fuller owned 33% of Beckham Ventures Limited, which he still does today, while Dodds was merely employed, not a shareholder. So the company was set up, design teams established, and in September 2008, Victoria Beckham revealed their debut spring-summer 09 collection. Much as expected, the clothes were extremely on-brand for Victoria Beckham, 15 looks of very tight, neutral dresses or separates to flatter the figure, a silhouette that she'd become known for in her personal style. 
The pieces were very wearable, very commercial, and desirable for buyers also who were said to be squabbling over stocking arrangements. However, as positively as this is framed, one thing is importantly missing. A creative point of view. This is probably best noted in this ad for the spring-summer 09 season, in which models run around an old English house playing what looks like hide-and-seek. The clothes, frankly, could have been from any brand. I know there was a gap in minimal wearable luxury fashion since Phoebe Philo's absence from the industry that we discussed in this video, but there's still nothing distinct about these clothes to brand them as Victoria Beckham. Plus, aside from the garments themselves, the ads don't seem to connect this minimalism need that was met in the clothes to the presentation of the clothes in the set. This strikes the audience as a little odd even back then because the garments and mise-en-scene didn't really match and Victoria Beckham herself wasn't known for these big country English estates with her severe bob and more modernly formal way of dressing. In my opinion, the setting was far more Alexa Chung than it was Victoria Beckham. Then, on top of the confused ad versus product, the collection debuted not in London, as one may expect, but New York Fashion Week, perhaps as a connection to their takeover of America the year prior, though if that's the case, why the big old English house in the advert? Because it's really just a confusing way to introduce the brand in the end. In short, the product, the place, and the promotion all seemed at odds with each other, almost like it wasn't well thought through past the celebrity factor. Sure, this meant that commercially the debut was a surefire success because the product heavily considered Victoria's personal brand while focusing on garments with universal appeal, but they had truly no artistic merit, something quickly pointed out by her fans as the pieces looked extremely similar to the dresses Victoria had already been wearing from Rolla Moret, who you'll remember was a Simon Fuller project anyway. It was quickly revealed that the garments were made using the same pattern cutters, seamstresses, and fabrics as Rolla Moret, but at this time, they were still claiming that the collection was designed without his help and that he had little to no input. However, even with that claim, because of the similarities and riskless design, instead of it being a true fashion offering, it all just read far more like a merch line than anything else. But though they wouldn't admit it, that was actually the point. In the debut collection, it seems that instead of attempting to do anything new with fashion, they were merely translating Victoria's personal style onto a luxury product and selling it to her fans in the most digestible way possible. The company was set up by the merchandising department of Fuller's company, after all, and it followed a lot of the themes of celebrity merchandise, as noted in this book. It was on brand, relatively affordable for the celebrity's biggest demographic, and simple, meaning that it would have the widest appeal when in a retail setting. They also purposely cut production to only 400 garments to impact the supply and demand balance in a way common in celebrity brand launches. This is named scarcity marketing and is used to make a launch or drop seem much more like a success or more desirable if slash when it sells out, potentially buying them a second season. This is used in celebrity brands to combat the problems of seasonality or the way that the novelty of celebrity runs thin quite quickly which McGoldrick notes as one of the most detrimental negatives to having a celebrity endorsement. This indicates that they very much did have a plan and it was a considered launch for what it was, but they seem to miss that fashion doesn't always work in the same way as other areas of retail, and as a result, the brand seemed to lack the elements a fashion brand needs for longevity after the initial impact of a celebrity brand launch has subsided. Specifically, as evidenced in the ad, it lacked that forethought of planning of who exactly the brand was and who the brand really was for, both of which are fundamental elements for a fashion brand. For now, that didn't matter so much. They were still in the novelty phase, but it certainly soon would. For their second season, the brand was able to continue to do fairly well with this idea. It still wasn't a unique look, but it was commercial and it had both the celebrity factor and a not-too-ridiculous price point for the quality, and so was picked up by several retailers once again. But that didn't mean they turned a profit quite yet. 
According to their profit and loss accounts from 2009, they ended in a positive of around half a million pounds, and they had a turnover of almost 1.3 million pounds. This is actually great. It's phenomenal for a startup business. But as you can see from their full accounts, they've noted their debtors as putting in 1.3 million pounds. This is just a guess based on what we know from future statements made by Victoria Beckham herself. But it's my bet that these debtors are the Beckhams themselves looking to make the company run. You can also see here that the shareholders funds are at around 600,000 pounds meaning that the Beckhams could theoretically take home £400,000 from the calendar year from their 67% stake in the business if it were to liquidate, meaning that though this is ending the year in profit for the business, for the Beckhams personally, they'd be in around £900,000 in the red. This wouldn't usually matter for most businesses because these shareholder funds are just an approximation of what the shareholders would take home if the business was to liquidate. But because this is for a celebrity brand, especially one that is so merchandise coded, it's very telling of the goals the company had at this point and ultimately the direction they would take the company. If this was meant as a cash grab, it had most definitely failed. Brands with celebrities often benefit off of the initial buzz of a new celebrity brand and slowly tail off in sales until they quietly fold or rebrand. I've covered several brands like this, both here and on Underskin, my beauty channel, but the difference with Victoria Beckham was that this wasn't like other celebrity cash grabs. It wasn't meant to make money. She all but says it herself in this International Herald interview with Susie Menkes that her company was just a hobby project, something she was doing for the pure love of fashion, and she was totally okay with losing money. Of course, that doesn't make her a good designer. She even says in the same interview that when she stops enjoying it, she was advised by Simon Fuller just to stop. But with that said, it's exactly this difference of perspective, the difference of approach from other celebrity cash grabs, that would prove to be its saving grace. You see, Victoria Beckham at this time was quite widely mocked for trying to make an upscale brand. It hadn't been done by a celebrity successfully before, and it wasn't taken seriously by most of the public and most of the fashion world either. If she wanted to be taken seriously, it was clear something was off. And impressively, instead of just folding and putting it down to a failure as Rihanna did with Fenty, they adapted. Fuller left the company on the 13th of January 2010, just before the Autumn Winter 2010 collection debuted, and by around a year later, by Autumn Winter 11, they had incorporated several new elements. In Autumn Winter 2010, they introduced sunglasses and jeans, both high-margin, on-brand potential cash cows that the celebrity impact of Victoria Beckham had succeeded with previously, bags in Spring Summer 11 in clutch and top handle forms, and in Autumn Winter 11, there's almost a full revamp of the look of the brand. It now looks more sporty. The colour palette slightly changed to include more dusty jewel tones, and the clothes seem less severe than previous. In fairness, this new sporty influence didn't really become noticed until Spring Summer 12. Even The Guardian ran an article about it, but it was still incorporated in Autumn Winter 11. Promotion-wise, Victoria was promoting herself in a more informed light as well. She did interviews with Vogue, who in fairness had been long supportive, and 10 Magazine that was in stark contrast to her previous interviews as they now were trying to display her knowledge of the industry in a way that added legitimacy to her business, enough even to win her the Best Brand Award at the British Fashion Awards in 2011. This 100% wasn't fully baked yet, but it was a noticeable shift. She was trying to prove that she wasn't just a celebrity with a fashion line, but that she knew what she was talking about and genuinely wanted to make a successful fashion company because she believed she had the talent to share. And in fairness, this was the start of a successful campaign. The opinion started to shift on the brand ever so slightly to make the public accept it not just as a hobby, but as a legitimate offering. It was really interesting time for the brand that effectively saved it from the same fate as other celebrity brands. It still wasn't making a profit, sure. By the end of 2011, they were at a loss of £1.6 million, but it was on the right track. 
and the Beckhams were willing to bankroll the project as they explicitly state in their full accounts for 2011. However, while I'm crediting this time with the start of the shift in perception, both of the way the brand saw itself and the way the public saw the brand, it really wasn't until 2013-2014 that the change was started to become really accepted by the wider public. All of which traces back to her most successful year in business so far, 2013, in which she saw a 91% increase in sales on the previous year, which led to a groundbreaking Business of Fashion interview that exposed just how the business was running, their troubles, their successes, and truly portrayed Victoria Beckham as a serious brand to other industry folk in a way that made those interested in that side take note right before the launch of her first tour space on Dover Street in London in September 2014, five months later. Not to get too candid, but I actually went to this at launch and it was phenomenally designed, merchandised and wonderfully on brand, but in a way that felt much more true to Victoria Beckham as a brand than Victoria Beckham as a person. It offered a way for those who hadn't seen a piece in real life, as I hadn't at the time, just to see how well made the pieces were in a place that made for good world building. It was a great move for the company that evidenced their understanding of their past confused product versus promotion versus place and remedied that by creating an experiential way to connect with the brand that showed it off in the most cohesive way possible. In this book, Oat Luxury Branding, which I'll leave an affiliate link for below, they discuss how celebrity brands often gain a head start in the industry because of their fame. But consumers today are jaded by how many brands are not rooted in brand strategy and instead plan on obsolescence, while what we consider to be valuable as art needs time to grow. In this same chapter, the author mentions Victoria Beckham as one of the examples of celebrity turned fashion brands, and it's really at this point, six years after starting the brand, that it's finally started to successfully affect the legitimacy of her brand as a fashion company first and celebrity brand second, at least to those with an interest in fashion. The journey of turning her celebrity brand into one with a more serious fashion offering was clearly very difficult. There were several competitors by this point, something we discussed in my Phoebe Philo video, and Victoria Beckham wasn't known for having the most unique perspective on fashion. From comparisons to Phoebe Philo, all the way back to Roland Moret, it was hard to pick out themes for the brand that couldn't be found in other companies. The one saving grace to this was that this genre of clothing was very commercial and very accessible. So as long as they were stocked, they could get business from a wider pool of people. And those willing to spend were coming from Asia. Though we don't have full breakdowns of demographics for the Victoria Beckham customer, she has long noted that Asia was an interesting market for the brand, all the way back in 2012 in the CNN interview I showed you earlier. So it's certainly telling that in 2015, their second store opened up in Hong Kong, and in 2016, the company would choose to start up a diffusion line in Korea. It's well studied that people in Asia buy more luxury goods than in the West. There's more consumer desire, and in general, disposable income is also higher. So. Offering to that market more opportunities to engage with the brand, especially in a way specifically catered to them, was a powerful move that saw a 7% growth in revenue in 2015 and sustaining that growth for 2016. However, the sustained growth of 2016 cannot only be accredited to the diffusion line and global expansion. You see, this was the year that they launched Victoria Beckham Cosmetics. I won't go into too much detail just in case I want to do a whole dedicated video on Victoria Beckham Cosmetics later on my beauty channel, but suffice to say, this was the brand's first openly licensed product and it did phenomenally well, growing year on year and really being the predecessor to the Victoria Beckham Target collaboration that launched in 2017, which weirdly was called Spice Up Your Life, tying it to the Spice Girls, not to the Victoria Beckham brand that I find really peculiar, I'm not sure why they chose to do that, and the Victoria Beckham Reebok license partnership, which they signed in November 2017, but launched in 2019. All of which combined to see a 17% increase in revenue to £42 million in 2017, far more than the company had ever taken before. 
Victoria Beckham was finally on the up and up. They had several cash cows, they were finally seeing respect as a serious fashion offering, and they had just received £30 million in investments from NEO investment partners. When right at the tail end of 2017, after the spring 2018 season, her biggest competition, Phoebe Philo at Celine, announced she was leaving the industry. This left a huge gap in the market for all the philophiles to find alternatives in minimal, comfortable clothing for which Victoria Beckham was already well positioned. They very quickly saw a huge boost to their profile as a company and achieved two new directors. Ralph Toledano, then the president of the Fédération de la Couture et de la Mode, and Oliver Shipton, who both arrived in 2018, their 10th year in business. Though Ralph only lasted 10 months, citing personal differences, Oliver remained and was there to see Victoria Beckham through the pandemic, where the company had narrowly avoided a very tough time with the 2019 launch of the in-house Victoria Beckham Beauty that included makeup, perfumes and skincare. But that wasn't quite the end of their restructuring, as, as they came out of 2020, they had a totally new plan for the fashion side too. In the first half of 2021, they completely restructured the brand, pulling in Victoria Beckham and Victoria Victoria Beckham, the diffusion line, into one, to become one, if you will, positioning the brand as a more luxury offering, while both lowering production costs and increasing output with their first pre-collection in the pre-spring 2022. From here, the company very quickly started to see growth and famously finally turned a true profit in 2022 after being in business for 15 years. It was clearly not an easy path for the brand, but there was a willingness to not give up that is at least admirable, even if it cost them a reported £80 million. Creatively, the Victoria Beckham brand is not the most unique. We've barely discussed the actual fashion design in this video because of that exact reason. But they make simple, minimal, well-made, comfortable clothes that regardless of the name attached to it, do have a market. So it's certainly possible for new consumers to like the clothes without considering the brand or the celebrity factor whatsoever. And though that helps them make surface level sales, especially now minimalism as a trend has returned, it's really the consistent changes to the business behind the scenes throughout all of the years that has allowed them to finally turn a profit. From changing directors multiple times, introducing new cash cows, introducing licensing to the brand, all the way to having cosmetics and then taking that in-house restructuring the business, they really were willing to change and adapt over time. It seems that, over time, they grew from what they have learned in a way almost like trial and error, which has finally proved that, though very difficult, it was possible for a celebrity to make a luxury fashion brand, just as long as they have millions and millions of dollars to pour in to help sustain it while it's finding its feet. It's that time that this book discussed that has seemed to be the key to the brand, at least time mixed with the willingness to adapt when something isn't working. On a wider scale, there are certainly celebrities I would not put it past them to bankroll their own ventures in order for their name to live forever. And I hope that the success of Victoria Beckham doesn't lead to that. We simply do not need more crap. But on a smaller scale for the brand itself, I'll be interested to see what the future holds. If this means they'll be looking at going public, which I doubt, or if they'll be looking to accept buyout offers, which I think is more plausible. I'm not really sure who from. Parent companies won't want to self-cannibalize and they all seem to have something somewhat similar. Richmond has Chloe, Prada has Prada, obviously. LVMH has Phoebe Philo. Really, the best places would either be OTB that has Margiela, but of course under Galliano, that's not really minimal anymore. Or Kering, who has Alexander McQueen, but also is not too, too similar in my opinion. Of course, though, that is all just me speculating, they may want to keep the brand to themselves and either sell or close it much later down the line without selling. We simply cannot know. Money hasn't historically been a driving factor to the company or to Victoria Beckham's motivations, so it's really anyone's guess. All in all, creatively, Victoria Beckham is not particularly exciting. But the behind the scenes of that 100% has been. 
There has never been another brand like Victoria Beckham, and I for one am very excited to see where it will go in the future because of exactly that. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do like and subscribe. I'm trying to reach 100k before the end of the year, which I know that I won't make, but I'll be damned if I don't try to make it. So please do share as well if you don't mind. If you'd like to see videos like this one, but about beauty brands, consider subscribing to my beauty channel Underskin. And of course, holler to my patrons over at Patreon for your ongoing support. And if you want to be my lover, consider stopping right now and let love lead the way over there.